I'm so happy to be here uh, this afternoon with everyone, and um, I've been given an assignment, and I'm really excited about this because I get to talk to us about us. Come on, look at your neighbor and say, this is about us. Okay, now, let me help y'all before we get too full of ourselves. It's, it's really interesting that sometimes when, when we come into the kingdom, God saves us and he delivers us, and we discover how much he loves us, and he cares for us. And if we're not careful, that becomes really individualistic, right? It's that whole mantra of, he reached way down low and, and snatched me out the miry clay and set my feet upon a rock to stay. Y'all know what I'm talking about, okay? If we're not careful, we think that we're the only person standing on the rock. But I'm here to tell you this morning that you ain't the only person on the rock. In fact, I discovered when I got into this thing that there was tons of people on the rock. And I thought it was just me. And so I'm, you know, starting off in Christianity, like, get off my space, get out. And, and the Lord is like, no, you have it wrong. You are not the only person that Jesus died for. You are not the only person that he has saved and brought into the kingdom. And in fact, his desire was not just for one person to be saved. I know it was said today, and it's true, that, that Jesus loves us so much. God is so enthralled with you that he will leave the 99 to go chase your trifling behind to bring you back to the flock. Okay, that, listen, that's what the scripture says. But can we expand our focus? Is he still had 99? And he wants a full flock. Look at your neighbor and say, a full flock. He wants a full flock. All right, and so I've entitled this message that, just listen to me carefully, you ain't in this alone. Okay. Now, that might be a bit too colloquial for some of you all, so we can clean it up with good English. You are not in this alone, okay? But look at your neighbor real quick and say, you ain't in this alone. Okay, what, what do I mean by this? Where are we, where are we going with this? Well, well, here's what happens. God saves us, and it, the Bible says in Psalms 68 and 6 that he sets the solitary in a family, and I believe this morning we had a great demonstration of that as we received into the body people that, yes, made intentional, prayerful decisions to join this church family. But beyond their decision, there was already a heavenly decision where God says, I'm leading you, I'm guiding you, and I'm going to set you in a family. Amen. Come on, the amens was kind of low right there. That's, that's fine. We're going to help you through this message. We hope to get some, some better amens. Because listen, here's the challenge. Family is not always easy. Family is not always easy. Okay? And I, my wife and I, Natasha, we've been married for almost 20 years. Praise the Lord. We have five beautiful children our oldest son, Zion, is 17. Our youngest daughter, Destiny, is 10. Am I right? I'm right on the numbers. Come on. <laughs> and so what I have seen over that course of 20 years, at least 17, because that's how old Zion is, is that when this family began to expand and we had these sons and these daughters, they did not always get along well. They did not always treat each other right. I actually recall that when our second oldest child, Asa, was born, he was only an infant, and we, I was holding him one day on the couch and just kind of showing him off to his brother, Zion, and Zion walked up to this kid, and he slapped the mess out of this baby. I said, I'm about to call the police for child abuse on this toddler. He, he, he not, and I said in that moment, I said, listen, for as long as Asa lives, anything that he does to you is justified. It's, it's for the rest of his life. It's justified. Because you just about killed this baby in my hand. Okay? So, sometimes that's how we act in church. Come on, y'all. 
for no rhyme, no reason, we act up with one another. And I said, Zion, that's your brother. You cannot do that to your brother. We're gentle with the baby. We love him. We care for him. We fight for him. We don't try to kill him. <laughs> right? This, this is not how you can act. So, so, so that was the beginning of it. Then we get all these other kids come along, and, and they have conflicts and sibling rivalries. They can't get along. And I found myself on more than one occasion saying to some child in the Williams household, you cannot do that. Why? Because that's your brother. That's your sister. That's your brother. That's your sister. And they would inevitably say to me, well, I don't want them to be my brother. I don't want her to be my sister. And, and so then, I, I, what do you say as a parent? <laughs> well, um, let, let me help you with this. You didn't have a choice in the matter. And so for whatever reason, I began to appeal to heaven. God decided that this was the brother that you would have. As annoying as he is, as obnoxious as she is, as much as they keep sneaking in your room and stealing your stuff, as much as they're doing all this stuff wrong, this is who God gave you to practice life with so that when you step outside of this house, you know how to act. <laughs> Come on. This, this listen, and I, I would tell them all the time, especially in my house with five of them, you ain't the only child. You, you don't have that luxury. You got to learn to share. You have to learn to get along. You have, somebody got to be second place. Well, listen, when we play a game, can't everybody be a winner? I begin to tell them, look, y'all, y'all, half y'all need to get over it. Let me help y'all. This is how I told my kids had to get over it. I said, this is, this is the truth. Because we would play some games. and every, I mean, these people would be towed up over losing. And finally, one day, I just said, guys, here's the revelation. God loves losers, too. <laughs> Nothing have changed in the heart of God just because you lost that monopoly. He still loves you just as much as he did before. Whether or not you have Park Place and Boardwalk, he still loves you the same. God loves losers too. The siblings have to learn how to get along. The brothers and sisters have to learn how to get along. And so... In, in every household, in good households, the, you parents, you probably have some type of house rules that help your children to know how to get along. We don't use these words in this house. We, we always open the door for someone else in this house. When the groceries come, all y'all jokers get up off the couch and from in front of the TV, get your behinds like you work at Walmart and you helping somebody with their groceries. Get out here and help carry this stuff in because you live in this house. So, so there are rules for this house. Can I say this? Living in the church, in the body of Christ, there are rules for God's house. There are things specifically, listen, that the Father in heaven has prescribed, this is how you handle your brother. This is how you respond to your sister. These things he has put in place. Why? Because when you carry yourself outside of these four walls and people look to the church, listen, they're not looking to the worship set. The worship set was beautiful. They all looked like they was getting along. Okay, they're not look, looking to, to how pristine everybody looking. Y'all look good sitting here, dressed up, hair combed, slick back. Smelling good, looking good, talking good. Listen, people ain't looking for that. They want to see what is the woo-woo when you get to work talking about what sister so-and-so or brother this or that did at the church. They want to see what is authentically happening in those relationships. What, so, so here's the help that, that God has given us. It's in the New Testament. Let me, let me just quickly give this to you. The Apostle Paul and several other of the, the biblical writers, James, John, Peter, 
throughout the evolution of the church, they wrote letters to those bodies of believers because they wanted to communicate with them. That's the best that they had in that day. If it was today, we'd probably do a FaceTime or a Zoom call or use some other type of technology to communicate with churches clear across the world. They didn't have that, so they took the time to write letters. Praise God he knew what he was doing because those letters have been preserved and we now have them as inspired scripture. Are you with me? Okay, so we have these letters, the inspired word of God, and they typically follow this type of pattern. Some type of drama happened in the church. Someone reaches out to the apostle and says, this is what's going down. The apostle sits down, takes time, drafts a letter, and usually about the first half of the letter, he's trying to sort out the mess and what the people are believing. All right? So usually the first half is related to doctrine, all right? Or orthodoxy. Just say that real loud. Orthodoxy. So usually you can go to any of these epistles. The first half you're going to see about what we believe and about salvation and about the spirit and, and, and things about the church. Usually the first half is related to orthodoxy because if you don't believe the right thing, we can't expect you to do the right thing. So he takes time to sort out the belief system almost in every letter. That's the pattern. But then the second half, he turns to this is what you should do with one another. Let me say that on this side. The second half of nearly every epistle is this is how you should handle and behave and respond to one another. And so Pastor Doug Craybaum, who was here a few weeks ago, he's done a study on this, and he says there's over 100 one another's in the Scripture, in the New Testament. 59 of those refer to a collective one another, or in layman's terms, y'all. So about 59 times, God has said, y'all need to act like this. Y'all need to not do this these one another's. Can I just quote Pastor Doug really quick? He says, practicing the one another's frees us from one of the biggest problems with the corrupt nature of sin, self-addiction. What did I just say? He just said very nicely, you ain't all that. He, he just said really cleanly, you ain't in this alone. And so to help you with that addiction to being the center of the universe, to, to, to thinking it's all about you, or, or maybe let me, let me help some of us sanctify religious people. It's just about me and Jesus. Listen, it ain't just you and Jesus because Jesus invited all these other people to your party. So, so these one another's are, so to speak, God's house rules for how we get along as his sons and his daughters. I want to take a few minutes this morning, church, if I can, just to give you a few. I said there's 59. We don't have time for all 59, but don't worry, we'll be back next week. Okay, let, let, me, let me just begin to lay out a few of these one another's. The, the, the first and primary one, Romans 12 and 10. Romans 12 and 10, the, the Bible says this, that we are to be devoted to one another in brotherly love. When I stopped and I began to just go through the list, it looks like there was at least 10 to 12 different times in the scriptures where Jesus said, or the apostles in their writings said, hey, when we get to this, how do we handle each other? They kept saying, love one another. Love one another. That, that's antipodal to hate. It, it, love means, Jesus actually defined it, he says, there's no greater love than this, than a man would lay down his life for a friend. So loving one another means that I'm willing, if need be, think about this to the nth degree, I'm willing to die for your success. Love one another. Love one another. Jesus said in another place, love, if, uh, Paul, love fulfills the whole entire law, right? Th this message, I could have I did this with a message. I could have came up here and said, love one another and drop the mic. <laughs> because if we get the revelation of loving other people, everything else follows suit. 
Our motivation has to be love for one another. When Natasha and I were driving in, she said, well, what, what about that love thing? Which love is it? You say, which love is it? What love is it? Do you know people got all type of definitions for love? I was talking to a young person recently, and essentially love meant to them that they could do whatever they wanted to do that made them feel good. Listen, that ain't love. Can I just say that? That is not love. Love says, I want what's best for you, even to my own detriment. Love says, I will put you first because you are just as valuable as I am. Love says, I'm going to model the steps of the Savior, Jesus Christ. And the Bible says that God so loved this world that he sent the Son to lay down his life, to shed his blood, to give of himself so that you and I could have eternal life in the kingdom. It's a commitment that you cannot so easily be wavering from. So love one another. I like this um, passage, 1 Peter 3 and 8. Peter said to the group of people he was writing to there, love one another. Finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love us, brethren. Be pitiful. Be courteous. All right? This, this idea of adding all those other emotions to it, he's saying, listen, love deeply from the heart. It's not a facade. It's not just a, oh, I love you, a, a cursory st saying, but it really means, no, I, I, I'm willing to seek out your good above my own. So we have to start with loving one another. In 1 Thessalonians 3 and 12, he says here, make your love increase and overflow for each other. All right? Meaning that this love has to grow. That, that we have to, in this context of relationship and interaction with one another, it's like I can grow in love for another person. I remember my pastor um, at the time when, we, when Natasha and I got married, he would tell all the couples, and he told us, he says, I know, this was on the wedding day at the altar. He says, I know y'all really think you're in love right now because you got this puppy love. Y'all have been dating for however long. You look good. She look good. Nobody's breath stank. Y'all haven't got on either one's nerves. This is the best day ever. You all are in love. He says, but give it five years. Come on, somebody. Give it five years. Can I just back up a second? Everybody that we just received into the church, can you give it five years? Come on, give us five years. Give it some time to mature and evolve, and then you will really love somebody because listen it's easy to love when I got a fresh fade and a sharp suit I mean I was fine on my wedding day <laughs> listen I walk past that picture every day I'm like that was the best haircut I ever had I don't know it was man, and I she said "Woo, come on baby <laughs> I walked past that that picture of Natasha in the wet she was beautiful the most beautiful person on the planet still is Come on. But do you know with her beautiful self, she could get on my nerves sometimes. <laughs> do you know as fine as I am, she could get upset with me sometimes. You could be mad at a cute person. It happens. But what, what helps us to get through is not all the external things that can excite you, but it's a covenant commitment that says, I'm committed to you and you're committed to me and so come hell or high water I'm sticking with you because you are who God gave me this is who God gave me and even when the person that God gave me can fail I'm still going to love them come on somebody I'm still going to stand by them. I'm still going to fight for them. I'm still going to support them. Why? Because that's what love does. The apostle John, he, he said it to, to the people that he wrote to in, in his epistles. He says, God is love. Think about that for a minute. God is love. 
That throughout all of human history, God has been loving humanity. Come on, when we, when, we, when we thumb our nose at him, when we reject him and rebel, when we build silly things like towers of Babel to, to try to take over his throne, when we become so perverse and twisted that he has to send a flood to destroy the earth, when nation after nation will bow to different gods and ignore him, disdain him, he still was always there saying, I love this world. I love every person on this planet through all generations. And if they only knew my heart, in time they will, because I'm going to give them my very best. I'm gonna send my son. I'm gonna send my son. And I'm not just sending him to reprimand them, to whip them into shape, but I'm going to send my son to lay down his life as a sacrifice. Come on, think about this. For people who misunderstand or who do not care. Jesus hung on that cross, and he was mocked, he was scourged, he was spit upon, disrespected to the nth degree. And on the cross, he is, his heart is in sync with the Father's, and he says, Father, forgive them, because they don't know what they're doing. They don't know what they're doing. Come on, guys, this is a house rule. We got to love each other. We have to love each other. Can I say that one more time? We have to love one another. Now, now, let me help you with this because I just referenced this. We also have to forgive one another. Come on, somebody. You know, forgiveness is, is kind of like, it's kind of like changing a baby's diaper. You have to do it often or that person's going to stink. Can you come with me to Colossians 3.13? <laughs> Colossians 3.13, everyone. We have to forgive one another. Look at what, what the, Paul said to this church. Forbearing one another and forgiving one another, if any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. This is a high charge to forgive people. Because so often when we are hurt, sinned against, offended, find out someone have talked about you behind your back or didn't necessarily agree with you, we, we can take that hurt so deeply to the heart and personal. And, and if we're not careful, our pain and hurt can become a part of our identity. Can I just help somebody to get free this morning? Pain and hurt can become a part of your identity. You become a victim. God has not called us to be eternal victims. He's called us to be healed and victorious. And even from the offense of friendly fire. Do you hear what I said? Friendly fire. Listen, there's been some fights in my house between these children between this sibling group, and they get so mad and, and start to, they say the, sometimes say the most atrocious things and declare that they even use that nasty H word, hate the other person, and, and, and the ones with nails start to act like these demon cats and can claw up uh, the other person's body. It, it gets fierce. And really, the remedy for that situation at any point in the escalation of the event was for someone to be gracious and forgive. I'm sorry. It's nice to hear, but can I help y'all? Even when you don't hear it, it's still right to be gracious and forgive. I remember years ago, I had been installed in a position of leadership at a school and I was working my tail off trying to make things successful and bring improvements. And it was a Christian school, so in theory these were Christian students and Christian parents. Um, in this particular story, I know that, that the people involved were all Christians. Um, we went to church together. We sang on the worship team together. 
And I had this parent in one instance, they came in to my office and they chewed me up one side and down the other and, and because they didn't like how their child had been handled in the situation. And I never forget they said, I can't believe you betrayed my trust. And it was like they just threw a dart and I'm you know, on the dartboard now. And I remember I got a little bit bad. I had some sanctified anger. I said, well, let me get up off this dartboard and show you betrayal of trust. Because you ain't going to come in my office talking like this to me. This is the main office. I was mad. And they left my office. I was, man, I was so mad. But the Holy Ghost said to me, he says, Shabaka, he does not understand your heart. I said, that don't make a difference for him to act like that. <laughs> the Holy Ghost said, he does not understand your heart. Therefore, watch this. This is an opportunity for you. Who was he talking to? To me. He says, this is an opportunity for you to be gracious and forgive. I said, God, you got to be crazy. <laughs> what? He says, this is an opportunity for you to be gracious and forgive. Because this is what Jesus would do. And he reminded me of that cross. He says, Jesus was on the cross. In, in your little situation, it ain't the cross. It's not the end of the eternity. It's not hanging in the balance because of this spat between my two sons in a church. Eternity was hanging in the balance. And his response to what he went through was to be gracious and forgive. In fact, the price he was paying was so that we could have pervasive forgiveness. And so the Lord said, this is an opportunity to be gracious and forgive. And I was like, God, I don't, I don't like how this sounds. I don't think I should have to do it. But I see that you're teaching me. And he warned me. He says, here's the deal, Shabaka. You, you ain't got to forgive. You don't have to. But I'm going to tell you this. If you don't, you will be just like the children of Israel who disobeyed. Come on, how many of y'all want to go into promised land? Come on, you want the promised land experience? Woo, milk and honey, come on, glory. Territory land, giants that we slaying. Listen, you got to obey. And so the word of obedience for me that day was, look, you want to get into the promised land? Then obey by being gracious and forgiving your brother. I said, okay, I, I forgave. And listen, it wasn't a cursory Forgiveness, And this is, this is the type that's hard. It's when you forgive somebody and you don't even have a conversation with them. Because that means in your heart, God does something to adjust you. Did you hear what I just said? Forgiveness adjusts you. It may not ever change the person that has hurt or offended you, but forgiveness is the work of the Holy Spirit in you. He's making you into a son or a daughter that looks like Jesus. It's you he's after. So I say, okay, Lord, I'm going to forgive. I forgave him in my heart. I don't even know that we ever had another conversation about it. And he came back around and things were great. We could sing on the worship team together. We could interact and serve together. It, and it was, again, the Lord, because of forgiveness, it was out of my mind. There was, there was nothing held against him. And then round two, round three of people coming and doing that. I was, this one time, someone came in and they said, this is the worst I've ever seen this school run. Everything is horrible. And it, again, they was upset about their child. It was usually somebody's child. And, it, all, and I said, okay, God, this time, no, I got this one. I typed up this email, and y'all know I know some words. So I typed up this email, and it had all these words in it. And I said, you can't, uh, oh, man. I was about to put him in his place. And I went to click send, and the Holy Ghost said, don't you click that button. I said, but Lord, you saw, and you know everything I'm saying is right. He says, that's not the point. Your heart is in the wrong place. I said, God. 
He says, you can't talk to my children any kind of way. I said, but they could talk to me any kind of way. He says, yes, they can. And I heard the echo of the Holy Spirit in my mind said, this is an opportunity to be gracious, 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 and forgive. Because how many times have I needed the Lord to be gracious and forgiving to me? And I remember I said that I cried. I deleted the email. I had to reply. And so I deleted it. And I remember sitting at my desk with tears. I said, I'm sorry. I think I've done my best. That's all I can tell you, sir. I've tried to do my best in this position. I'm sorry. I always want to improve. And that's what I'm going to work on. And I sent the email. And the very next day, we had a pancake breakfast, a fundraiser at the school. And I walked in the door, and this parent was there. And he ran up to me, and he said, Shabaka, I am so sorry. Will you please forgive me? He says, I have a hot temper. You know that. I'm used to just spouting stuff off. I was really mad at my child and mad at the situation and, and, and inadvertently just took it out on you. Will you please forgive me? I never meant to hurt you. And because, watch this, because I had already made the internal decision to obey the Lord and to forgive this person, then I could actually receive what they were saying. Because had the other email come out, we would have just been fighting. Like I've been picking up pancakes at that breakfast and slapping people with them, throwing bottles of syrup. It, it wouldn't have been reconciliation. And listen, can I tell you all this again? We went to the same church. We served on the same worship team. Our children played sports together. I'm talking about the body of Christ, the church. How will we handle one another? Okay? So we have to forgive. Can I give you one more? Can I, can I give you one more, church? All right, let's, let's go to Romans 12 and 10. Actually, no, Philippians. For the sake of time, can you take us to Philippians 2 and 3? Philippians 2 and 3. It says, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem the other better than themselves. This concept there, that phrase, lowliness of mind, what it means is humility. It says that we need to humbly look at each other. We need to put each other in the place of preference. We need to to, to bring ourselves low so that other people can be exalted when it's the proper time. We need to esteem other people better than ourselves. Again, this is another quality of Jesus. In this same passage in the book of Philippians, Paul is writing to the church, and he's, this is where he begins to mix the orthodoxy with, other word, orthopraxy. Can you say that? Orthopraxy. Orthodoxy is right belief. Orthodoxy is right behavior. So we, we, orthopraxy is right behavior. So we got to believe right so we can act right. Okay. So he's saying if you believe that Jesus came from God in heaven and emptied out all of his glory so he could come into the form of a baby and take on human flesh and endure the vulnerabilities of this world uh, yet without sin. If you believe that he humbled himself that way, then we expect that as believers you would empty yourself of all of your glory. Of all of your pomp and circumstance and privilege and right of way, that you would pour all of that out so that you can esteem someone else more higher than yourself. So we can put other people first. Because you know what happens? Well, if you get a household, parents, just think with me. Let's just dream this morning. What would happen if all your kids were humble? Amen. Come on. Can you imagine a household full of humble jokers? Ain't no fighting, no slamming doors. There would be food on the table when the last person arrives. Just imagine if everyone was humble. 
if, if we preferred each other above ourselves. Oh, no, you go first. No, you go first. No, you go first. No, you go first. You would, you would never get in the van and hear people whining about somebody is in their seat. Oh, I don't have any seat. Just wherever you want to sit. Go ahead and take it. No fights over the biggest slice of cake or pizza or this. No, oh, no, you, you go ahead. You take the biggest piece. You deserve it. You look hungry. Come on, come on, somebody. Now, listen, you're laughing, but I think God looks down on the earth and he's like, I wonder what would happen at CLF if these people would embrace my word and be humble. There would be no competition. We wouldn't be fighting over anything. And I'm not saying that we are, but can I just put it out there? Y'all know in some churches people fight over positions, that people fight over the front row seat. That people get mad and offended if you don't speak to... No, listen. If, if we would embrace humility, the Father says, what would my church look like? How attractive would it be to a lost and dying world that's being trampled by the king of pride? What would it look like? How would it function? These, these are the one and others. Let me just give you uh, other quick ones here related to humility. And in Romans 12, 10, he says, in honor... Honor one another above yourselves. First Peter 5 and 5, he says this, clothe yourselves with humility towards one another. What does that mean? He's giving you a word picture, meaning put on the right attire to interact with somebody else. Put on the right attire. Put, can I say that again? I, I might be speaking more than one thing to, today. Put on the right attire when you come and approach someone else. I, my, my son was sharing with me the story the other day. He works in a food service industry, and he said he was there taking his family's order. And a young man just took off his shirt right there at the counter. And after he did it, he asked his mom, Mom, is it okay to not have my shirt on in here? <laughs> and you know sometimes when you go into these stores, what do they have on the door sometimes? Oh, you all have read the sign, right? No shirt, no shoes, no service, Right? And so the mother told the child, that's not appropriate because you are in this establishment and, and you need to put that shirt back on, okay? Can I tell y'all something? When you come into the house of God, and I don't mean the physical service, I mean when you come into the family and you begin to have relationships with one another and interact and serve with other people, uh, uh, keep your shirt on. <laughs> Clothe yourself with humility, right? Because humility, uh, listen, Pride will bring a destruction. It says pride comes before the fall. You will fall and you'll cause other people to fall if you come in here dressed the wrong way. So clothe yourself with humility. Listen, God knows you're great and all that in a bag of chips. He knows it. And he don't need you to promote yourself. The flavor of my chips is barbecue. <laughs> Would you like a sandwich? No, no. Listen, we know you're a prayer warrior. We know that you're a pastor. We know that you've had experience. We know that you can sing. But clothe yourself with humility. Because you know what humility allows to happen? Humility allows people to receive you and not just your gifts. We see what's authentic when we clothe ourselves in humility. I want to stop here, church. We'll come back to this. This is, this is what I want to say in closing. As I was praying about this this week, again, the Lord just kept bringing to me the analogy of the household. And what happened, at least in my house, or what is happening over time of going through all of the normal growing pains of having a family and having to deal with sibling rivalries and, and even, you know, sometimes as we would respond to them as parents, as mothers and fathers, at times we'd have to go back and repent because we didn't handle it right. That's part of clothing yourself with humility. It's repenting when you didn't do something right. But in the midst of all of that, what we've begun to see in many instances is that our children are adopting a maturity of context and behavior that looks like God. 
And this is how I know that, because we'll be someplace. We'll be out in public or somewhere, and people will come up randomly and say, that child is so respectful. They're so well behaved. And they'll just walk up, you, you have great kids. I had one, one older lady stop me the other day. She had had a few interactions with my oldest child, and she says, if I had a 17-year-old, I would, I would want them to be like him because he was just so honoring and, and respectable. And, and what I've realized over time is that the work that we do as parents, that if my children will allow that to go, not just into their behavior patterns, but into their heart, it's transforming who they are. Come on, they came out the womb as these selfish, rebellious, me, 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 me hellions. And then that's, then that's your task for the next however many years, parents, is to work that out of them. You understand? So watch this. You come into the kingdom, and he transforms you, and then is sanctifying you along the process so that one day people are able to say, when they see your life, when they see our interaction, our relationships, they're able to say, I, I want to be just like that. I want a family that just looks just like that. I want relationships with people that look just like that. And you know what happens then? That's a great opportunity. Not to puff yourself. Oh, yeah, I've just been working on me for a long time. No, no, you haven't. God's been working in you through a long time. I was, I was finishing up thinking and praying about this yesterday, and, and I just heard the Lord say this. I'm going to submit this to you all in closing. The Lord said, Shabaka, you have to understand that many times people are your process. Sometimes we want to come into the house of God and we just want him to zap us with his Holy Ghost wand and make everything disappear and be okay. And he's, we come into the altar crying, crocodile, Lord, just change me, just change me. And you don't get zapped, but then you walk away and your discipleship person comes into your life that the brother or sister that sometimes gets on your nerves comes into your life. Your family members are, are asking. And, and, and the Lord is like, listen, you asked me to change you. And then I let you enter. Listen to this. I let you enter into a process where your life could interface with the life of others in my kingdom. And guess what will happen in that process? I will change you. So can I encourage the church this morning? People are your process. God loves people. Every single one of us. And in this church body, ain't a one of us perfect. We all got something we're working on. And he reminded me of this. I said, Lord, this process, I'm making this up. These people ain't going to receive this. And he, he gave me the verse in Proverbs. As iron sharpens iron, so does a, the face of a man to his friend. You want to be sharp in the kingdom? You want to be a tool that he can use in your hand? Then submit and surrender to the process of people and practice the one in others. Amen? Amen. Amen.